Well, good morning once again. Welcome to your Bibles. To this morning, we want to be looking at Revelation chapter eight and nine. So, if you want to turn your Bible there, I can't really see you this morning, which is good. It's probably good, right? Now you won't feel like I'm looking at you. So if I'm looking wherever, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> Let's just pray. Let's just go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, that you are the God who's on the throne. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, that you are righteous and holy and just and perfect and loving, Lord, and long-suffering and kind. Father, thank you so much that we, as we draw near to you, we know what your word says about you and who you are. Lord, even as we read about these extreme things um, that's going to happen in a time soon and very soon, Lord, we, we thank you that we have salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that that you made it available, that you love the world so much. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the privilege of being called the children of God. And so this morning, as your children, Lord, we draw near to you, and we come before you, and we ask, Father, may you speak to us. We desire to hear your word, Lord. We ask that in Jesus' name, that you may bless this time we have together now. Amen. So Revelation chapter 8 and 9. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand, and then the angel took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then a third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then a fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard the angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who were about to sound. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as scorpions of the earth of power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. Their tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their powers to hurt men five months. And they had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, behold, there's still two more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had a trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and a day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. 
I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, those who sat on them at breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. But these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Like, wow. You know, this morning we really now get to this time that we speak about of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. It's a terrible time. Really, the judgment of God coming down on the earth, and it is cataclysmic. It is hectic. And as you might be thinking this morning, as you even read these things and hear it, you may be saying, like, why? You know, why is it so intense? Why is this coming? And it's almost like when you read sometimes some things in a word, because from your human perspective, you may not necessarily just agree with it, and it's almost like you are questioning why God is judging, why God is allowing these judgments to come upon the earth. Maybe you, in your heart, you're like judging you know, God's judgment, but I want you to realize, first of all, very important thing is that God's ways and God's perspectives is not like ours at all. God's work com is completely different. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, the reason why is because he is the potter, we are simply the clay. We are part of his creation. He's the great almighty God who made everything for himself, for his glory, you know, and it's difficult sometimes because we don't understand a lot of things on this earth. We have a very limited understanding. And, you know, as the clay is being shaped and being formed and being molded, we're like, why? You know, that's oftentimes, but we must remember there is a potter. And so, I mean, have you ever tried explaining calculus to a two-year-old? You know, probably not. I mean, you say, well, try explaining to my 18-year-old, right? It's like probably like it's a difficult thing. Now take that and you times it by infinity and then you sort of get the kind of gap that we're talking about here between us and God. It's something like his understanding is infinite. He's above all things. And so God sees the full picture, but we in comparison to who God is, we are almost blind. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we see in a mirror dimly, but one day we'll see face to face. And so we have to look at God's judgment in the light of God's character of who God is. So always remember that. When we read these things and you see these catastrophic things coming upon the earth that's going to come soon and very soon, we have to look at this judgment in the light of who God is. And then, again, it's about faith, it's about trust in this God who is. Because God is, as we all know, almighty, omniscient, omnipotent. He is eternal. Sure, he's all those things, but God is also perfect and holy and righteous and just. And he is all of that together, and we must never forget that. Remember when God told Abraham that he was going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to judge the place? You remember back in the Old Testament, that story right there in Genesis 18? And Abraham, with these human thoughts, He's sitting there and he's listening to God going down now to see if Sodom and Gomorrah is ripe for judgment. And he says to God in Genesis 18 verse 23, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And then a bit further in verse 25, he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And what's the, what's the answer there? Of course. The judge of all the earth shall do right. It's something that because we know who God is, we know that he will always do the right thing. And then we see Abram starts bargaining with God, right? Because he's worried about his nephew Lot, who's in Sodom. And so he brings it, he's like, God, if there are so many people, you know, will he still spare them? And he bargains with God all the way down, you know. But at this point, he didn't really understand that part of God's character yet. That God will not judge the righteous with the wicked, you know. He will take Lot out of that city before he brings judgment on the city. This is who God is. In the same way, you may look at this without understanding, but we need to trust God. 
I mean, these things, if you read it and you understand, you comprehend what, say, what is being said here, it's, it's crazy. But we need to trust God because He always does what is right. And that's why I find that the more we get to know God, the closer we draw to God in our personal relationship with Him, the more we know Him, the fewer questions there are. The closer you get to God, the more the questions fade away and the more faith and trust becomes the way by which you live this life, the more your understanding will be. And so this morning we are still in the third and the last section of the book, the things which will take place after this, according to Revelation 1 verse 19, that divine outline. And the the part we're speaking about here this morning is still the first half of the tribulation. And although this is not the easiest book, I mean, no one can say this is an easy book, right? But this is not something that you have to run away from. This morning we spoke about it again. You know, so many people don't read the book of Revelation because they think you can't understand it. It's a difficult book. Let me tell you, it's not easy everywhere, but it's not difficult to understand. And we've got the outline, so we read it chronologically as it is. And it's the only book that promises a blessing for those who read and those who study it in, in Revelation 1 verse 3. And so just to catch up again, in chapter 5 we saw the scroll, right? In chapter 6 we saw the lamb loosening these seals one by one. And every time that he loosens one of the seals of the scroll, something hectic starts happening. These terrible things are being um, poured out on the earth. And then in chapter 7, last time, we looked at the 144,000. Those special people of God from the nation of Israel, and he mentions all these tribes who are sealed during this time, and none of these things will come upon them. And so the last seal we haven't spoken about yet. We've been through six seals, and now we get to the seventh seal. Let me tell you, if you think, so, if you think things are bad now in the world that we live in, <laughs> this is nothing, this is nothing compared to what's coming. I mean, we're still living in a time of God's grace. Right now, today, we are living, yes, maybe in the beginning of sorrows where some of these things, the birth pains are starting to happen. We see a lot of crazy things in the world. But we are still living in the dispensation of grace where God's grace is there, where the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, who's resisting, who's holding back the evil, he is still restraining the world. I mean, the time that we're talking about, as evil as the world is, we're talking about the tribulation time is, first of all, where God's wrath is poured out, as we see here. Secondly, it's a time where Satan is unrestrained. Thirdly, it's a, it's a, it's a time where humankind is unrestrained. There's nothing restraining all the evil thoughts of their heart anymore. It's nothing compares to what is coming the time that we are living in now. And I want to tell you this too. Don't worry that you are ever in the tribulation because when you're in the tribulation, no one will be having debates of whether we are in the tribulation or not, everyone will know this is the time. You know, it won't be like a theological debate. Do you think we're on a tribulation time now? Because there won't be any questions like that. You see, it's, it's so vastly different from the trials and the tribulations we're experiencing right now. And so in these chapters, we find first the seven seal judgments, then the seventh seal opens up to then the seven issues in the seven trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet again issues in the seven bowl judgments. And together, these are catastrophic and cataclysmic to the whole world. It's, it's devastating. God's wrath poured out, like I said, Satan and man unrestrained. And we've looked at the parallel between Matthew chapter 24, if you remember last time, the parallel exists, the same things that's said in this section of Scripture right here in Revelation and in Matthew chapter 24. But it's very important for me, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, when the disciples asked the Lord about the end of the age, what is the first thing that Jesus told them? Listen to what he said to them in Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. He said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and, and will deceive many. So when the disciples asked the Lord, just like we all interested in how these things going to play out, what's going to happen? They said, Lord, what's going to happen in the end times and how are these things? And he said, watch out that you don't be deceived. Don't be deceived about these things. And I tell you, there's a lot of confusion because people don't know the word of God. And there's a lot of people with their own ideas. And so I think it's very important, don't be deceived because things are going to get far worse. But what the Bible tells us it will get worse and worse and closer and closer together as these birth pains work out. And so, you know, chapter 8 and 9 before us here, although the exact timing in the sequence is very hard to figure out, I always say when it's not clear in Scripture, then it's obviously something God has withheld from us for a reason. 
What is clear is we knew that, first of all, they are real. These are literal things. This is not just a symbolic book. These things are real. It's very clear when it's symbolic because he says things it's like, or he uses an example or something like that. But it's, it's, it's real. It's literal. Secondly, we know that these things increase with intensity. As the time goes on, even in tribulation time, it increases. And thirdly, we know that it parallels some of the plagues that God sent on the land of Egypt. If you think back to the time in Egypt, all the way back in the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of these plagues. Uh, a lot of those plagues correspond to what we read about here. And so I think where people go off on tangents, their own tangents or their own feelings or their own ideas, they go down in this rabbit hole of their own interpretations, it's because they make a few mistakes. And one of the mistakes they make is they confuse and misunderstand the difference between the church and the nation of Israel and the tribulation saints. If you get confused about who they are and you make them all the same or you apply different things to different ones, it's not supposed, you can be very confused in this book. Secondly, they forget that the beginning of sorrows are birth pains, like I said, that increase in frequency and intensity. This means we are now living in a time of sorrows. We see crazy things happening in the world. Every now and then there's this like, wow, you know, and then it, like I said to you last week, then it goes down again. And these things are getting more intense as time goes on and it's getting closer to one another. But once the tribulation time comes, then it's there in full force. It's like tremors or like four shocks before earthquake. Before the real earthquake happens, oftentimes, I mean, we don't have earthquakes here, so we don't really know that, but before the earthquake happens, oftentimes there's tremors to warn you like, hey, like a four shock, there's, a, there's an earthquake coming. And this is the time we're living in now. These are four shocks, all these things that are happening in the world to shake us, to tell us there is a crazy time coming that we don't want to be part of. And I think the third mistake they make is they try to figure out the timing of things too precisely. You know, some of us are just wired like that. You want to understand every single thing. You want to know how everything fits everywhere, but God doesn't explain it like that. And so where the Bible only tells us the order, the Bible tells us the clear order of the things happening, but the Bible doesn't tell us the exact timing of when everything happens. And so today, if you're taking note, a revelation of the trumpets. And I think it's also very good to read the book of Joel together with um, these chapters right before us. And so maybe you can do that this afternoon if you want to or sometime during the week. But if you're taking note, the first thing you can write down is the seventh seal, number one. We now get to the seventh seal. Look at verse one again. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So we, we, what we see with every seal so far, the seal is broken and something crazy happens immediately. Now the seventh seal is completely different. The seventh seal ushers in now seven trumpet judgments is coming from that. And it flows again chronologically and sequentially. And I think it's important to understand. That's why we read the book like that, because all these things are in series. This thing after this one, this one after this one. Every time he says, meta tata, after these things. So it's like, you know, it runs in an order. And so one after another, which in turn is followed by the seven bold judgments, like I said, and it all culminates in Babylon's destruction and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it says here, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. After this great worship we experienced in Revelation 17 to 12, there's this holy hush in heaven right here, and half an hour. And it's this very precise timing. I mean, I wonder how John figured it out, you know, if it was, but, but he knows this. There's a half an hour of silence in heaven. And I mean, what we're talking about here is complete silence. And so, I don't know if you've ever been in a place of complete silence. There's so much noise and sounds in the world. But if you're just in that place, this speaks about something so heavy and so awesome about this moment that creates almost like a pause in heaven. There's just like this pause and everything is quiet. All of heaven becomes soberly aware of what now lies ahead for the earth and all its inhabitants. It's like this heavy moment and everyone in heaven is aware of what's going to happen now. Like Zephaniah 1 verse 7 says, be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. This is a big moment. I mean, we think about the Psalms where he says, be, 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 um, be still and know that I'm God. It's one of those moments. It's this peace of quiet. And this is the moment where all those closest to God, the angels, the saints, all those who know God, they know that God never wanted to get to this point. God never wanted to do this with mankind. And this is very important to understand. Ezekiel 33 verse 11, 
God says, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? And if you think, when it comes to this point, there's been unlimited chances given for people to turn to God in faith. God's demonstrated his love for the whole world by giving his son on the cross. He's come reminding people, telling them, giving them chance after chance after chance. So when this time comes, this is what God never wanted for people, but they put themselves there because of their stubborn rebellion. And there's this heaviness, this is quiet before this all starts playing out. Because everyone knows they with God in heaven, they know that God would rather give grace and salvation than judgment, but because he is righteous, because he is perfect, because he is just, he cannot let it slip. He has to do these things. And so all of heaven is now watching in awe. As you could say, the Lord makes this executive decision right here. This is the time. Look at verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So here's the second series of judgments burst really out of the first series of judgments. The seven angels, again, the Bible doesn't tell us who these guys are. It's not clear. According to Jewish tradition, there are seven angels who stand in God's presence. But all we know from the text here is that these seven are seven other angels with apparent authority. Obviously, they have great authority for the job that they're going to do now. And it says, to them is given seven trumpets. Now, trumpets is significant in Scripture. You know, in Numbers chapter 10, we see a lot of that. We see three important uses, really, in the Old Testament of trumpets. The first one is to call God's people together. Imagine you were Moses out in the wilderness with like a couple of million people, you know, without cell phones. How do you get them together? You, go, beep, 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 you know, whatever, whatever it may be, the sound of that trumpet. You have a trumpet that will call the people to assembly. Secondly, you have trumpets that announces war, tells the people it's a different sound. It will tell people this is the time of war. And there's also the third trumpet is that announces the special times. It's like when the law was given in Exodus chapter 19. And, you know, when a king was uh, enthroned, whatever it may be, there's different reasons and different ways for the trumpets. So just like the Old Testament battle alarm, you could say, think about the conquest of Jericho, which is, by the way, a very interesting picture when you think about what's happening right here. Jericho, they had their trumpets, they marched around the city seven days, right? And on the seventh day, they marched around seven times. Isn't it interesting? It's very similar to what's happening here with the trumpets and, uh, you know, coming out of the last seven seal. And then they blew their trumpets at this moment. And so this is sort of the, what we're talking about, the sound during the great tribulation that ushers in these new judgments. And so verse 3 says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the, go at the altar he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So some people see this as Jesus because they get symbolic about everything. But when you look at the Greek, at the text again, the Greek means it's another of the same kind. So it just means it's another angel. It's not Jesus Christ that's speaking of here. Because some people say, yes, he's our high priest, and that's all true, but this is not Jesus that it's referring to. And he's given much incense to offer it with the prayers of the saints. And again, I want to remind you that prayers are offered to God as incense. We saw that in Revelation chapter 5 too. So prayer, just like the incense, is precious in God's sight. It's something that we pray, and if we pray according to God's will, these prayers goes up to God like a sweet-smelling aroma. And so ask yourself this morning, what does the aroma of your prayer smell like? Your prayer life, what is your prayer life like? If you pray in God's will, if you God's will to be done to know God, then your prayers will be like a great heavenly aroma going up to the Lord. And so always remember, when we pray, it's not just something that you do in a far corner where no one can see you. This is the most significant thing you can do. These things are brought before God. God hears our prayers. And it says here, all saints, the prayers of all the saints. So obviously it refers specifically to the tribulation saints in Revelation chapter 6 verse 10. Because they cried out a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? But it also, it says all saints. So it refers to all the saints' prayers. 
So this is not prayers for selfish, personal vengeance, but it's a prayer for God's righteousness and God's vindication. Like, I mean, I know many of us have prayed that too. Lord, please just come back. This world is crazy. This world is far gone, Lord. And we know he's only tarrying because there are still people to be saved. But we've prayed that before. And this is the time when those prayers will be answered. And it says, upon the golden altar before the throne. Just like we saw the tabernacle again, the altar in the tabernacle and in both the temple and the tabernacle. So the golden altar stood before the veil. It was used for burning incense in Exodus 30. You can read about that. And again, we see the earthly tabernacle is only that picture, that Old Testament picture of, an, of a New Testament reality of something that's going to happen in the future. Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So all these holy prayers ascending before God on the altar. Verse 5, And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Here we see another earthquake. Remember I told you there's quite a few earthquakes. So a spectacular display as he threw, this angel threw it to the earth. The, the, the word there in the Greek is to cast, to thrust these things on the earth. And then it says, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So this holy hush then this thunderings and lightnings and earthquake, and then these trumpets now start going. And so the seven trumpets proceeding, and it sets in motion these seven judgments. So the first four trumpet judgments we're going to see right now brings destruction on earth's ecology, you could say. The last three devastates earth's inhabitants, and they bring such disaster on the earth that they are called woes in, chapter th in verse 13. You're going to see that now. But if you're taking note, this is the second section we're going to look at now. You can write down there the seven trumpets. Look at verse 7. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So the first angel sound, this is that big moment now. As Joel chapter 2 verse 1 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Like I said, the book of Joel is a very good book to read together with these chapters of Revelation. And then it says, as he blows this first trumpet, hail, fire followed, mingled with blood thrown to the earth. It sounds like the seventh judgment in Egypt, if you think about that. Joel chapter 2 verse 30 says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. So we don't know how it's going to happen. A lot of people are always interested, like, how is this going to happen? They try to explain it in what we understand about the world, you know. So maybe it could, could go together with some, you know, catastrophic volcano coming from the earthquake or whatever. Some people said nuclear explosions. We don't know what this is going to be, but this is a judgment from God. So the point is not what causes it. The point is this is what's going to happen. What's going to happen? A third of all the trees and all the green grass burnt away. That's crazy. I mean, we had a fire on Helderberg just, you know, like a week ago or so, and it was crazy. And that was just a little bit of our town, you know? Now think about the whole earth, a third of the earth. So no matter what it is, no matter how it happens, it's already dry because of the water shortage, because a third of the vegetation of the plants is burned up during this hailstorm. And this is a literal thing. And so, when it comes to Bible interpretation, once again, if trees and grass don't mean trees and grass, <laughs> you know, then what do they mean? Then it, then, then it means nothing to us. Then it's like some people wonder, like, why God has put this book in the Bible, just to confuse them. This book is there for a reason. It says what it means. And so, you, you never go beyond that. So just think about how this would affect the balance of nature and the food supply. The moment that a third of all the green things are burnt away. It's very hectic and you have to understand. I think it's also important to understand this is not nature taking its course. This is not just nature running on and going. This is important to understand this is the judgment of God. That's why I say when you are in the tribulation time, it will be completely different. You will know that this is coming. This is not a natural thing that's just playing out. Revelation 16 verse 11 says, we see that the people on earth know that these events are from God. They understand it, even though they don't trust and believe in Him. 
Verse 8 says to us, Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures of, in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So it's just immediately the next trumpet judgment. There's no sort of recovery, no break after the first one. It's just like second judgment, go. And the next guy, the next angel blows the trumpet. And then he says something like a great mountain thrown into the sea. So again, people can speculate until they're blue. What is it? Is it a meteor? Is it an asteroid? You know, what is this thing? <clears throat> the Bible doesn't say. When the Bible says it is something like a great mountain, <laughs> you know, it means it's not a great mountain. It, it, again, he's, he's making a comparison. He's telling us it's like and so the fact is, this blazing mass of something that looks like a huge mountain is going to be cast into the sea. So whatever it may be, like a great mountain burning. And so when John is sure about something, he says it. When he doesn't know what this is, he just says it's like. He tries to explain it to us in terms that we may be able to understand because he doesn't have the vocabulary. So maybe it could be an asteroid that crashing, crashes down onto the earth. It can result in, you know, oceanic upheaval and leftover pollution. We don't know what it may be. The thing is with the asteroid, when it hits the earth, a couple of things happen because normally it kicks up so much dust, you know, that it goes into the atmosphere. It prevents the sun from reaching down and immediately the temperature drops. This huge temperature drop that can lead to the death of many living things. That's just what we understand by science. But I mean, it can be, because it's coming from God, it may not even just be an asteroid. It says that it's cast into the sea. So maybe it's a specific reference to the Mediterranean because that's the sea around this, this area right here. But I don't know if global damage will come from just that area. Maybe it is because we see a third of all these things. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of ships, a lot of things happening in um, the Mediterranean. So I don't know. A third of the sea became blood. It reminds us again of the plague in Egypt, the first plague in Egypt, Exodus 7, 90 to 21. And what I want you to understand is this is clearly judgment. <clears throat> this is not just something happening. This is judgment coming from God, just like it was in Egypt. Look at verse 9. It says, A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So just think of the stink. I mean, you, you read about the frogs and things in in, in, in in Egypt, the plagues in Egypt, you know, and just think when it all died, you know, all these things besides, you know, it's like, besides the fact that everything is dead, now there's this huge thing that you have to deal with. A third of these things are dead and they stink and it's, it's, it's crazy. A third of the ships destroyed. I mean, huge fleets, specifically in the Mediterranean. It's possibly destroyed by this tidal wave or whatever, this huge tsunami that's going to come from this thing falling into, from this mountain-like thing, falling into the sea. And then verse 10 says, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So again, like you see, these things are coming one after another now. The time is now, and there's no more time in between. So not, no waiting to recover, just the next judgment. And the next one, the third one, is this great star that fell from heaven. So here he calls it a star, so the Greek word for star is actually the aster. It's where we get our word for asteroid from. So this might be, in fact, be an asteroid. We don't know what the burning mountain thing might be. But it says a star. So it's possibly, I mean, God, we know that he's numbered and named all the stars. It tells us in Job 9, you know, so God knows all these things. And so John knows it's a star specifically. You know, even our top scientists today, they, they are saying it's not a matter of if something like this would happen. It's a matter of when. I mean, these things are all around us. You see the movies even. They make movies of these things because it's a reality today. NASA has a space mission at the moment. It's called DART. Double asteroid redirectional test. It's a test method of planetary defense against um, in, um, NEOs, near-Earth objects. And so that's something that, that they try to bring up this defense system to you know, make to hit asteroids or something that they can take another, um, another way around the Earth or whatever. It's launched the end of last year, the end of November 2021. Before that, the, the, the space mission was up against the asteroids was Neowise 2013 to 17. It's a space telescope 
that they sent out to hunt for all the asteroids and the comets so they are aware of the things that might be coming, might be on a collision course with Earth. That's what these guys, the scientists, are worried about. The ESA, or the European Space Agency's Near Earth Object Co Coordination Center, the NEOCC, they keep and maintain a risk list of 1,350 NEOs with a chance of impacting our planet. So they are observing these things. They are checking these things out. This is a reality that even the people on Earth is aware about. These things could happen. But when it comes from God, let me tell you, it's not gonna, you're not going to work it out scientifically. He's going to say, now's the time for that. And the point is, this event is divinely controlled judgment. And so I think to help and try and figure it out with science, to have this idea like, we're going to check when this asteroid is going to come, and we're going to get a team together like Armageddon movie and go and blast this thing. You know, that's man's attitude, but that's not going to help. No one's going to be able to come against this. Look at verse 11. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became um, wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The whole time you just see things and people dying. So wormwood is a very bitter, woody herb, and it's a proverbial thing in Israel and in these nations for bitterness and for sadness. And so I want you to note again, this is way different than the things we see today. If there's strange weather patterns, you know, if there's um, darkened moons or something and people all freaking about the blood moons or if there's meteorites or bolides or whatever coming into our atmosphere and burning up you see these things happen these are natural phenomena that happens but this what we're talking about here is way different so it says a third of the waters became wormwood so undrinkable because of this bitter poisonous substance first of all no rain now a third of the drinking water supplied is destroyed I mean, we're talking about very tough times. We know what drought is like in our country. We even have places in our country still as struggles with drought at the moment. God oftentimes allows this to draw people's attention. And in this time in the tribulation, it's specifically for that. He wants to get the people's attention. Guys, I don't want to judge you. I don't want to send this judgment on you. I want you to turn to me in faith. And it says, many died from the water that was bitter. Just like their sin and their rebellion, you could say, has left a bitter taste in God's mouth. Look at verse 12. Then a fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. So the third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. You know, even as the fourth angel sounded now, by this time, you don't see anyone turning to God. It doesn't mention anyone that's turning to God. God, help us. These things are going crazy. It's just the next judgment. And so what happens in the fourth judgment, a third of the sun is struck, a third of the moon and the stars. I mean, it affects, it affects the entire globe because these things we're talking about is cataclysmic for our world that we're living on, for life on the planet. A third of the day did not shine. Again, it parallels the ninth plague in Egypt, Exodus 10, verse 21 and 23. Darkness, when darkness came upon um, 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 them. Interesting. The effect, it affects everything. Everything is affected by this because it's not a third of the lessening of the light, it's a third of the day and the night are plunged into absolute darkness. Very interesting. We're talking about an eight hour period where there's just no, no light whatsoever. Again, you could try describing the how. You could say, well, it's an asteroid, it ticks up the dust. You can come with all these scientific ideas, you know, but it would be useless speculation. None of us know exactly what this is, why it's going to play out. And for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, you know, those details don't really matter. And so you would miss the point entirely if you are focused on the how and how this is going to play out. And, you know, listen to what the idea is. Matthew 24, 29. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. I mean, we're talking about things that are outside of any man's power. We can't even control a fire. We can't even control a wave in the sea. Now we're talking about, you know, great big things. Joel said in Joel chapter 2, 2 and 10, he said, The day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. 
The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. You know what? The thing that you have to realize, God's been saying this since Old Testament times. He told us, this is going to happen. And what I find out when you don't listen to the word of God, when you come to the reality of it, then it's too late. Then it's too late like, oh, I should have listened. Right? That's the problem here because people don't take the word of God at its value. Look at verse 13. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who were about to sound. So some pastors have suggested this is an an eagle, but they get the word wrong. I think I've even done that before where I misunderstood this verse. If you look at it there, the Greek word is the word angelos. It is angels. It's speaking about an angel flying flying throughout heaven with his great light voice, and he says, woe, woe, woe. What that means is it means what is coming now is so bad. Every time you see in Scripture when someone says, woe is me, it means like this is something really bad coming now. And it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. What's been happening up until this point has been completely crazy. But guess what? What is coming is still even far worse. And he talks about the inhabitants of the earth as opposed to the citizens of heaven. Those who have been raptured, those who are with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Philippians 3, 18 to 21. He says, because the remaining blasts of the three angels are about to sound. So now we see the first four planet is pretty much destroyed. A third of the planet is not working. There's no light. There's no water. There's, everything is crazy. And now he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because now what's coming is going to be worse. He says, you ain't seen nothing yet. You cannot fight and win against God. And it's something we have to understand. This is not a movie. So it's not human power that's going to rise up and you're never ever going to be able to face God when this time comes. And the main thing is, we have to understand, God could destroy everything like that immediately. He could just say the word and everything would stop existing. He holds the atoms together is what the Bible tells us. So the fact that God brings it like this incrementally shows us the great restraint. He's been warning the world for thousands of years. This is what's going to happen. This is what's coming. Turn to me. And now is the time of judgment. And when God does it, he even restrains himself so he doesn't just unleash it like that. It's still restrained. God's still trying to get people's attention, even in this time. He's allowing them to have so much suffering that they can just turn to, the, to God, fall on their knees and say, God, I need you. But guess what? We don't see that. We're living at a time where we can already see people turning against God, but this time in a tribulation, is people are not even, they know it's God, they know they are sinners, but they just don't want to acknowledge it. It's so bad. Giving them another chance, desiring them to repent and to turn to Him. So these four first trumpets, like we say, can be called natural in the way that they affect the land, the water, the heavenly bodies. And it shows the severity of God's judgment as he attacks the basic stuff like the food, the water, the light that gives you the regular you know, rhythm of the days and that kind of thing. And it's all God's desire for sinners to turn to him. And I think again of these passages like Ezekiel 18.32, Ezekiel 33 verse 11 where God says, I have no delight in punishing people, in sinners dying. But the wicked, they only harden their hearts. They're like Pharaoh. Once again, you look at the plagues that happened in Egypt. You know, you read the Bible, and the first few times it says, um, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and eventually it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He gave him what he wanted. Eventually God said, okay, you have what you want. And this is what we have right here. The first four trumpets, just like the first four seals, brought judgment directly against the earth. And now the fifth and the sixth judgment, we see the release of, of demonic forces that start tormenting people and then killing them. This is crazy. Look at verse 1 there of chapter 9. Then a fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this is now the first woe is coming as the fifth angel sounds. Revelation 8 verse 13. Like again, I remind you, read the book of Joel together with us for more insight to this demonic time. But he says, a star fallen to, from heaven to the earth. Now, the star he's speaking about now is a different star because he calls him him. 
He, he, gives, he, he connects him to a personality. So, like I said, you have to listen to what John says. Sometimes he says it's like something. something sometimes he says it is something. And sometimes he says, you, you can read in the text that he's speaking about a person right here. So angels, we know, are sometimes associated with stars in Scripture. You know, like Job 38 verse 7, Isaiah 14 verse 12. And also, if you look at the verb tense here of the word, when it says fallen, you look at the, the verb tense, it means it has fallen already. This is a star that has fallen already. It's not a star that's falling right now. It's a star that's fallen already. And if you think about the scripture, you bring it together, I believe this is speaking about Satan, the fallen angel. Luke 10 verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 says, How you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You see, the stars of God, the rest of the angelic realm. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the, of the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then he was cast down. I believe he's referring to Satan right here because he gives him a name. He says, to him is given the key to the bottomless pit. You don't have a, give a key to an asteroid. You know, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. This key is given to him at the specific time for a very specific purpose. It's part of God's plan and he serves God's purpose even though he doesn't intend to. He's playing out as God already foreordained. And it says he gives him the keys to the bottomless pit. That's the Greek word abusos. It means the abyss. According to what we understand from the rest of Scripture, it's probably in the center of the earth. We don't know. Synonymous with the Greek word Hades, it is called the realm of the dead, Romans 10 verse 7. But this is not hell. This is not the lake of fire. That is later. This is the holding place. And so it's a prison for certain demons like the demons that came out of legion, you remember the guy that begged Jesus when he met him in Gadara, you know, and, and, and he met him and he said, please don't cast us into the abyss. Luke 8, 31, it says the demons begged him they would not command them to go into the abyss. This is like that kind of thing. These demons are, some demons are sent there. And you think to yourself, like, what kind of demons get sent to the abyss? Well, it's the really bad ones, right? The disobedient ones. The ones who don't walk with, in the way they, you know, even allowed to. And so it must be really bad demons. Look at verse 2. It says there, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And the whole time you see death, you see destruction, you see darkening and darkening. It just gets darker because the picture also of the spiritual world at this moment, what, what's happening in people's hearts and lives. And so as he opened this bottomless pit, the smoke arose like this great furnace. It's very graphic. It's like a, like a horror movie, really. The sun and the air darkened. So the smoke from the heart of the earth, you know, and so much is turning the sky dark. And again, I believe, although it's a physical thing, although we're talking about a literal thing here, I do believe there's a strong symbolic meaning to this in the sense of the strong delusion that Paul said is going to come on the earth, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8 to 11. The delusion has already started. I mean, this is already, people are already getting deceived, but then this delusion will be so strong that they're unable to see anything of the truth. Verse 3, it says there, then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So we're talking about an army of demons coming out like locusts, you know, locusts in hordes. Like the eighth plague in Egypt, Exodus 10 verse 15, it says they covered the face of the whole earth so the whole land was darkened. You know, and so the idea is there are so many locusts that like they bring, it's like a cloud overshadowing the sun. A visual representation of the hordes of demons swarming to the earth. Now let me tell you, these are not Muslims. <laughs> these are not Turk Turkish people. These are not heretics. You know, you can't just apply this to whatever you want. This is speaking specifically about these really weird creatures that we don't know what, what they look like. And to them was given power as a scorpion. It means these are not lo normal locusts, okay? They have tails like scorpions that can sting you. This is crazy locusts. Biblically, we know locusts are agents of God's judgment. 
It's a cons- consistent Old Testament figure. If you look at passages like Exodus 10, Deuteronomy 28, look at Joel, you look at Amos chapter 4, you see it's, it's associated with God's judgment always. Then in verse 4 he says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So, a normal locust would harm the green things. It's like, no, don't harm that, right? And so, only those who do not have the seal. The only ones who have the seal, we saw in last time, 144,000, the seal of the nation of Israel, those 12,000, you know, per tribe, those, those witnesses we talked about, they are sealed against all these things, but everyone else is not sealed. And they're going to go through this pain. Look at verse 5. And they were not given, a, they were given a, sorry, they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like a torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. You see here, even when they come upon the earth, they can only do in the limits that God prescribes. They cannot just do whatever they want. They are still limited by God in their torment. And so now it says to torture them for pain. This is not going to be a time where, where people, you know, they're not going to be able to die. It's going to be a time of, there's a set time by God. The purpose and the timing is governed by God for the purpose, I believe, to bring people to repentance. Again, God's desire, even in this crazy time, is that people will be in so much pain and suffering that they will just cry out to Him and say, God, save me. I'm sorry for my sin. That's the one thing that God wants because He knows where they are destined and He doesn't want to send them to hell for eternity. Revelation 9, 20 and 21, right? And so like the tor- scorp- torment of a scorpion, apparently some scorpions in the Middle East are the worst. There are some scorpions who can kill a man with their sting. And then in verse 6 it says, In those days men will seek death and not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. It means you won't be able to kill yourself. So they sit with this torment, this, this, this intense pain, and they will not be able to kill themselves. It's crazy. Death will not be possible for five months. Then 7 to 8, it says there, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. Their faces were like the face of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. I mean, really. Who knows what that looks like? It's like a really, you think about a locust with like hair, and like, you know, it's like, it's really weird. That's why I say I don't think God intends us to understand what these things look like because that's not the point. They've got bodies with like horses, faces like men, teeth like lions, demons' heads, and crowns. It's, it's just very weird. And crowns may suggest that these demons have a higher rank of authority over the other evil spirits. We don't really know. But there's a reason for that. And then verse 9 says, And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. It means they are battle ready. And, and when you look at them, the idea is they are so fierce, they seem untouchable. No one can do anything against them. That's the whole point of this picture. Verse 10 says, They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Terrible torture without any hope of death. Verse 11. And the head is a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So this is interesting. This is the fallen star. This is talking about Satan right here. The angel of the bottomless pit. That's the one who has the key. That is Satan. And so another indication here that these are not normal locusts, because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 30 verse 27, locusts have no king. In Hebrew, we get these two words. This is what, it call, what they call him, Abaddon in the, in the Hebrew and Napoleon Greek. So in the Hebrew, it means destruction. And Napoleon in the Greek means destroyer. So you get the idea here. The Bible tells us about Satan. Jesus actually said in John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief does not come except to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan is a destroyer. And he's already at work in this world, and he tries to destroy every single one of you, if he could. But this time, he will be unleashed to do like his worst. Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. And you think almost like, what? I just want to go sit down. You know, it's like, it's, it's really crazy. 
Imagine one is bad, two to go. So this is the sixth and the seventh judgments. And I think at this point, I just want to give you a word of encouragement. Because, man, I mean, we are the church. It tells us this is a blessing to read these things and to understand these things. And I want to give you a word of encouragement this morning. If you're a born-again believer, just know for a fact that Satan is a defeated foe. He's completely defeated. He cannot touch you when the blood of Jesus Christ is on you. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's one of those verses that you should know. If God is dwelling in you through his Holy Spirit, if Christ is alive in you, then he is greater than he was in the world, and the world cannot touch you. So don't be afraid of these things. This is terrible things, but the warning of this is so that people may turn to God. Verse 13 says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the sixth angel sound, I mean, this is not the sound of good news, right? I mean, we've, this, this is now, the next woe is coming. So I don't know if you, people can hear these trumpets on earth. The Bible doesn't tell us if, if it's audible for the people on the earth, but I know that the, those in heaven do. And so from the four horns of the golden altar, again, Exodus 27, Exodus 30, and this is the to the answer to the cry of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, where they cried out, God, avenge us, and now this is happening. So verse 14 says, And saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So, so you think there's some more coming, some worse ones coming than there already was. I mean, you can't even get past this locust image with the hair, right? And so now he says there's even worse ones coming at the great river Euphrates. Interesting how this river plays such a big part throughout the whole scripture and always connected with a lot of the stuff that's going on. We see the river Euphrates first time mentioned in Genesis all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. It was a landmark. It was one of the four rivers in the Garden of Eden. So it's right there from the beginning. A landmark of the ancient Babylon, that what we call Iraq today. It's one of the landmarks. The longest river of Western Asia, 2,865 kilometers, and it runs past all these many ancient cities that we read about where major things happen. Ur of the Chaldees, Babylon, you know, we're located on it. It's also the boundary of the old Roman Empire, which we know will be revived under the Antichrist. And so if you think about this river Euphrates, it is associated with the first sin in Genesis chapter 2, associated with the first murder Genesis chapter 4, the first dictatorship, Genesis chapter 10. The first organized revolt against God in Genesis 11, 1 to 9. And the first confederated war in Genesis 14, verse 1. There's always been a lot of connections of evil with this river. And so, look there at verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Again, a very specific purpose, a very specific timing here, released to kill a third of mankind. So these are fierce demons, worse than even the locusts, and their purpose is to kill a third of mankind, and they execute God's judgment in his timing. And it says in verse 16, now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. This is crazy. So I mean, many people say it's impossibly huge, because if you think about the writers in Scripture, when they talk about innumerable numbers, they say 10,000 times 10,000. Now, this is twice that. You know, so we're talking about a huge army right here. And he says, I heard that number. It's not like he sat there and counted each one of them. Right? So he heard this. Is this how big this army is um, that's going to come, this horrible slaughter and destruction? And thus, I saw the horses in the vision, those who sat on them at breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. It's a powerful picture of horror and destruction by this colorful, demonic army that's coming. But you know the, the color? I mean, sulfur yellow just says so much, right? It's not like sunshine yellow. It's like sulfur yellow. The whole thing is just, it's just indicating of this time. And the horses, these are not normal horses either, right? They are breathing fire. I don't know if you've ever seen horse breathe fire. I haven't. 
Verse 18. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed, and by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. This is so crazy. This is staggering. I mean, it's unlike anything that has ever been before. That's why I say, when you're alive in this time, if you are still alive, you're not going to wonder and speculate, is this that time that the Bible spoke about? You see, this is so far different, so never wonder and worry about, oh, maybe we missed it. Maybe we're in the tribulation. You're not. You're going to know when that time comes, especially when you're a child of God. And then some people say we are in a tribulation right now. According to some people's theology, this is tribulation. And I'm thinking, like, you read this, and you, read what, you see what's going on, and this is not the same thing. According to other people's theology, we are in the millennium. You know, we already passed all of this. We are in the, the thousand years of peace. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You know, like, have you looked at history? There is something like history. And this has never happened. This stuff that we're talking about right here now. And so since the fourth of mankind already is killed in the fourth seal, Revelation 6 verse 8, this means now, by the time the sixth trumpet comes, half the world's population is killed. And people are worried about COVID. You see, it's crazy. Are we talking about staggering numbers here, like serious, serious things? Verse 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So it's like this Medusa-like thing with these heads. I don't know how it looks. <laughs> um, verse 20 says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And this is important, and I think this is the crux, and this is the saddest thing that you'll probably read in the Bible. After all these things, after all these things that God allows incrementally to get worse and worse and worse, and let me tell you, that is part of the time of the sorrows we're living in. The reason why things on earth, things are not going to get better. That's the good news, <laughs> right? Things are only going to get better in Jesus Christ. Things on this planet, there's no hope in this planet. Things are going to, God's going to allow to systematically get worse and worse and worse and worse for the reason of getting people's attention, saying like, don't live for yourselves. Live for the kingdom of God while there's still time. And so they see all these things, these hectic things, and despite all of these things, they didn't show any repentance despite all these destructions and these wonders around them. And I think this is the most frightening part for me of the book of Revelation. Not the judgments of God, but the fact that people can be so stubbornly hard-necked in their sin that they just don't want to let go of their sin. They'll go through all of this, but they won't repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's incredible to me, even while God is judging them. It says there that they should not worship demons and idols. They knew they were wrong. They know there's a God and he's busy judging them for their sin, but they do not want to get to that point where they say, God, I'm sorry, please help me. And at that point, I mean, after the tribulation, after all these things, after eventually the great white throne judgment, then there's eternal hell and suffering. You know, they knew God was judging them and they chose to find rebellion instead of turning to God in repentance. They chose demons Dead idols, it says, that can neither walk nor see nor hear nor walk. Useless, worthless things. And that's the saddest part. They turn from the living God who doesn't want to bring any of this on them, who's been telling them for ages, like, please turn to me. I send my son because I love you so much. I don't want you to go through these things. And even now, they still want nothing to do with Jesus. Verse 21 it says, and I did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, or their sexual immorality. Or their thefts. These are exactly the same things that characterize the time we live in now, although it's much smaller. It's already completely out of control in the world we live in, but this characterizes this time. The state of our world. Sorceries is the word pharmakia in the Greek, it speaks of drugs. You know, thefts we all know, murders we all know, and then of course, sexual immorality. It's rampant in our world like never, ever before. It's a crazy time, but it's going to be worse. And this is what they choose. These things that destroys them, they choose this over the eternal life with the true living Son of God. It's not me. So 
This is their choice, right? Unimaginable. And let me ask you this morning, where are you with the Lord this morning? Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God wants to save you from this? There's a reason why Jesus came to the earth. Because man cannot save themselves. This was never God's desire. 1 John 4, 6, we know that God is love. This is who God is in his being. There's nothing greater that God could do for us than to give his only begotten son. To become a man, to die for us, the death that we couldn't die for ourselves, the death that we couldn't pay with. John 3, 16 and 17, listen to this again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's desire. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, that is God's desire. Romans 5, 8 said, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the worst thing we cannot even imagine. God knows who we are, and in our worst moment, it says, that's when he died for you. That's how much he loves you. He knows our sins, our struggles, our weaknesses, and he still chooses to love us. But you know what? God cannot, cannot let the rebellion of even one person change who he is because then he wouldn't be righteous and true and just and holy and perfect if he allows sin to go unpunished. Joel 2 verse 12 and 13 says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Now I want you to understand this. By the time the tribulation comes, God has been relenting for such a long time. He's been trying to hold back, trying to get people to turn to him, but they don't want to, and they finally push him to that point where now he has to bring his righteous judgment to come to pass. God is still standing with open arms this morning, though. We're still living in a dispensation of God's grace. This is still time to come to Jesus. And the question is, have you done this? Because if you haven't, do it today. If you haven't turned to Jesus, do it today. If you don't know that you are saved, if you don't know that you walk out of this gate and a car runs you over, that you will be in heaven with Christ, then do it today. Don't procrastinate. God wants to save you from all the bad that's coming. And if you're a believer, on the other hand, you know, you may say, well, so what does it matter? Because we're going to be out of here, buddy. So we're not going to see any of this. So why should I care? Let me tell you, if you're a believer and you read this and your heart isn't breaking, then there's something wrong. When we read this as believers, it should turn our hearts to say there's a world out there that is lost, that doesn't know Jesus, that's going to hell for eternity, and our hearts should ache in pain, and we should be witnesses to this world, and we should evangelize and tell them about Jesus Christ who came to save them from the wrath of God is coming from eventually eternal hell. You know, this should stir your heart to be a witness. Luke 21 verse 36 to 34 and 36 Jesus said, take ye to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day should come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare upon all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Guys, we are not living in the 80s and the 90s anymore. The time that we are living in, we are living in serious times. And things are serious for a reason because God wants to wake us up. There's no more time to play around. I look at my kids and I look at myself when I was that age and I think how much time I wasted. How much time I was completely confused and I was playing around with things I shouldn't have been playing around with. And I want to tell you, we're living in serious times. There's no more time left for that. Jesus is coming back soon and very soon. You know, this week uh, in Family Devotions, we read, start reading 1 John. And 1 John 1, 5 and 6 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I think that's part of it. Don't deceive yourself to think that you are walking in the light when you are busy with things of the darkness. You cannot be light. and It's like a light switch. It can either be on or off. <laughs> it's like this morning. That's off. Christ is never off. Christ is always in the light. 
And so I think it's just a warning, again, an encouragement for us. Use the time that is still left. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So where are you this morning? Do you know the one, the only one who can save you? Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with a sobering um, scripture before us, Lord, these two chapters that really make the hairs on our necks stand up. Father, we know this is not your will to bring destruction on the people of this world. But Lord, we force you with our own sin. And Father, this morning I want to pray for that seriousness. First of all, for everyone who calls himself by your name, who calls himself a Christian. I want to pray against any deception, self-deception, any any um, of these things of the world that gets us bound. Lord, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I want to pray against all these things. Father, may we not be deceived by what's going on in the world. May we not be deceived by what we think we are righteous and we think we are good. Lord, may we see the truth as it is before you. And I want to pray, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you, who does not have that living relationship that life in abundance with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to pray, Lord, that you will bring conviction to their heart this morning. Thank you that we are still living in a time of grace. Thank you, Lord, that it's available to everyone who just turns to you and calls upon your name in sincerity and repents from this world. It says we have everlasting life then. Thank you, Lord, this is not just something that happens one day. But the moment we turn to Christ, you come and you make your home inside of us. You live in us and you change us. And I want to pray for everyone who's sitting here, Lord. May none of us be left behind when you come to take the church to be with yourself before you bring judgment on this earth. I pray, Lord, that you may count us worthy and we know our worth is in Jesus Christ. Father, make us serious. Make us true witnesses for you in this day and age. Give us a heart for the lost. Father, that we may constantly be living that life of touching people and speaking to people about these things that is important. Give us your heart, Lord. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.